So welcome uh, to the second installment of Labor Now, uh, a monthly three-part panel series brought to you by Verso Books and Jacobin Magazine, uh, where we bring together trade unionists, labor journalists, and labor historians to talk about worker power in our present moment. Uh, this project has two purposes. Uh, one, to facilitate public conversation uh, about the labor movement. Um, and two, to produce materials for the labor curious, as we call them, um, who might just now sort of be jumping into labor politics for the first time. Uh, so first I was recording this, thank you very much. Um, right now we have a very interesting resurgence in class-based politics, uh, particularly among young people, um, particularly after the Bernie Sanders campaign. And we have a lot of people suddenly very interested in uh, labor politics, but due to the last 40 years, and, uh, and to some degree, the, the class makeup of the people who are drawn to this, they're not particularly uh, well-versed in labor politics. So we're doing as much as we can to sort of start these conversations that are av available to people who are you know, unaffiliated, but also kind of opens up a space to talk about more nuts and bolts for people who are. Um, so last month, we talked about building unions under Trump, which is a, a daunting prospect, but it's not historically unprecedented to build uh, union power when the right wing is in charge. Um, this installment is centered on union reform. Uh, so uh, I'll just read the sort of prompts that I gave everyone. Uh, the operations and internal structures of many of the larger modern unions would be unrecognizable to the radical trade unionists responsible for the major progressive advances in this country. Far from their initial conception as democratic organizations of the working class, many unions have undergone a process of NGOification, where leadership has been subsumed by unaccountable bureaucracy and or the Democratic Party, and the rank and file are often reduced to a funding source with little to no power. Recently, though, there have been some marked excess in internal member-led reforms. So how do workers take back the unions? So um, we have today Beth Breslau from Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Um, the Teamsters are probably, um, uh, let's say, the most uh, present uh, uh, union in, in sort of anti-union propaganda historically. Um, I think. People have generally seen Hoffa or something like that. Um, but what is more interesting uh, was what is happening now, which are these major um, sort of democratization uh, efforts going on within the union. Uh, if you were paying attention around Christmas, uh, there were uh, strikes because there were 70 hour work weeks. It's um, an incredibly active and promising um, sort of movement within the union. Uh, we also have Pamela Galpern from Communication Workers uh, of America, Local 1101. Uh, if you've read Jacobin, you might have read Alex Gurevich's coverage of um, two very recent strikes uh, with Verizon, one of which wasn't that successful, one of which was actually very successful, and it was largely uh, credited with a, a sort of union reform movement within uh, CWA, um, which is going to talk about more of that. Um, but first, we're going to talk to um, Alexander Bradbury, um, editor and co-director of Labor Notes. Uh, it's very interesting when you talk to some of the older people who are involved with um, trade union movements and very left-wing trade union movements because the thing they miss most often is they're like, you don't know what it was like. Uh, every, every newspaper in the country used to have a committed, dedicated labor reporter and, you know, Again, last 40 years plus the trajectory of print journalism that doesn't exist anymore. But Labor Notes is doing this amazing job of not only uh, doing the journalism and doing the coverage, but also bringing together um, this sort of left labor movement. Um, so she's going to start uh, talking a little bit about union reform broadly. Great. Uh, well, thanks uh, to Verso and Jacobin for having us all and to Amber for hosting. Um, union reform, what a big topic. We could spend a whole fascinating evening digging into the twists and turns of reform efforts in any one union, and you are in luck tonight that you're going to hear firsthand accounts from the trenches from two fantastic union sisters, I'm proud to know, Beth and Pam. Uh, but first, I want to put these two cases in a broader context. I'll start by talking a little bit about what we mean by union democracy and union reform. 
I'll give a very brief overview of the cluster of reform movements that gave birth to labor notes in 1979 and the role we've played in supporting these kinds of movements since. Uh, and I'll talk about why, even as the economy and the labor movement have changed around us and uh, unions face all kinds of external threats, we believe it's so crucial uh, to push for unions to be truly run by their members. In this talk, I'm borrowing liberally from my colleagues at Labor Notes, past and present, uh, especially my mentor, Jane Slaughter, our longtime editor. I rely on Jane's analysis and history, especially when it comes to events 30 or 40 years ago, when my interests ran more to nap times and tantrums than strikes and concessions. Uh, but I'll start with a story from the present day. Patrick Green is a bus driver in Nashville, Tennessee, ATU Local 1235. He and his coworkers were frustrated that they had no say in negotiating their union contract. The union executive board would send out a letter to members asking for suggestions on what should be in the contract, and then that would be the last you'd hear of it uh, until the contract was settled. Uh, members didn't even get to see what was in the contract until after they voted on whether to ratify it. So Patrick and his coworkers tried to get involved in the bargaining process, but union leaders rejected all their efforts to help. Then they decided to run for union office, challenging an 18-year incumbent president. They organized town hall style uh, debates among the candidates at a Shoney's restaurant where members showed up with their families to uh, lob questions as well as eat breakfast. And Green and his slate laid out a vision for greater transparency and member participation in negotiations. As you might imagine, that went over like a stack of fresh blueberry pancakes, and they won two to one. Uh, once in office, they jumped right into negotiations, won a $3 an hour raise in starting wages, and made sure that this time rank and file members got the chance to read the contract before they voted on it. That all might sound very basic, and I wish we could take it as a given that members get to read the contract they're voting on and be part of the campaign to win it. But the unfortunate truth is too many unions are like Patrick Green's local used to be. Labor isn't gonna get far until we get these fundamentals right, and the biggest changes needed in our unions and in our workplaces will come from members organizing themselves the way those bus drivers did. One of the themes in this Labor Notes book, Democracy is Power, which I think is a classic, uh, is that union power requires democracy. Democracy is not simply a moral question. It's key to unions' ability to meet the challenges they face. Union leaders can sit down with the boss and make demands. They can go to DC and make powerful speeches. But the boss and the government are mostly not going to be moved by strong words. What moves them is when a demand is backed up with action. And ultimately, the strongest tool in workers' kit is our ability to strike. So that means to be strong, unions need active members. Commonly, you hear a distinction drawn between a service model and an organizing model of unionism. The idea is that a service model is based on union reps providing a service for members, filing grievances, for instance, while the organizing model asks members to get involved and do things for themselves, like join a march on the boss. But this distinction doesn't really get to the heart of the matter. Filing grievances and marching on the boss are both essential activities for a strong union. And even unions that profess to follow an organizing model can be top-down, uh, run mostly by staff. Members may be asked to do a lot of things, show up for rallies, phone bank, canvas, appear in the union newsletter, but often they're not part of making the strategy. They're treated like a faucet to be turned on and off, uh, not really being organized so much as being mobilized. And people won't stay involved for long if they don't have a real input into the union's program. So by democracy, we mean not just formal rules such as fair election procedures, though those are important, we mean a culture of control by members. To really build power, unions need to exponentially expand the number of members who have the skills and the confidence to act like the union, and we need to give them the authority to do that. I take it that tonight's crowd probably includes one or two leftists, is that fair to say? Um, so I, I wanna take a moment to dispense with a couple of myths I often hear on the left about unions. On the one hand, there is a romantic idea that it's the corrupt and conservative union bureaucracy that is all that is holding workers back from revolution. Uh, alas, this is just not true. And uh, the spread of so-called right to work laws and other attacks have continued to weaken our unions as institutions, and yet this has not released a magical wave of bottom-up militancy. It has made workers less powerful and materially worse off than ever. Many workers are understandably demoralized, and even the best union leaders face an incredibly challenging environment. But on the flip side, you also hear on the left an equally false notion that it's the conservative knuckle-dragging members who are holding back the progressive union leaders. And when I hear this view, I tend to suspect that the person saying it isn't much interested in the core project of unions, which is to shift the, pal the balance of power in the workplace, to challenge and ultimately break the power that bosses wield over how we spend our days and minutes on the job, over our pay, our well-being, over whether we survive the workday. 
I challenge you to name me a labor leader who is more invested in those questions than the workers themselves are. So one of the core principles that guides us at Labor Notes is to put at the center of our organizing the on-the-job concerns that shape people's daily lives. Pay and benefits are obvious ones, but here are some others. Does your supervisor sexually harass you? Do you get a bathroom break and do you have access to a safe bathroom? Do you get chances during the workday to rest your feet and to rest your brain? To joke with your coworkers? Do you work alone? Is your workload increasing? Are you constantly monitored by cameras? Does your job put you at risk for repetitive injury or cancer or violent attack or heat stroke? If you work with the public and they treat you disrespectfully, are you still required to smile? Do you get some autonomy in how you approach your tasks? Do you find satisfaction in your work? If we can build organizations that give people the tools to build the power to transform those conditions of their work lives, that's an organization that people will want to be a part of. But to become this kind of organization, many of our unions need a serious overhaul, a transformation from the bottom to the top. And I want to emphasize that uh, running for union office is not an end in itself. The point is to build a union that can fight and win. Unfortunately, many unions have leaders who aren't interested in making that transformation, who in fact find it threatening. And that's why running for office and replacing them is often an absolutely <coughs> crucial step to build a fighting union. That's why I think, uh, when I think of the most influential and inspiring strikes of my lifetime, the UPS strike in 1997, the Chicago Teachers in 2012, Verizon in 2016, a crucial element they all had in common was fights for union democracy. So that brings us to the role of Labor Notes, which was founded nearly 40 years ago in 1979 to unite reform efforts in several unions. It was a time when coal miners were engaging in thousands of wildcat strikes over safety and grievances and getting the Black Lung Bill passed. They had a reform movement inside their union, Miners for Democracy, and they had elected one of their members as their union president. When Jimmy Carter got a Taft-Hartley injunction to stop their strike in 1978, they said Taft can mine it, Hartley can haul it, and Carter can shove it, and they kept on striking. Team Search of Democratic Union had been formed around getting a decent master freight contract. There was a reform group in the auto workers, a United National Caucus, and steel workers were demanding the right to a rank and file vote on the basic steel contract, a right they didn't have, and they had come close to winning their union presidency too. So Labor Notes was founded as a monthly newsletter to help these groups in steel, coal, auto, and trucking communicate with each other and recognize themselves as part of something bigger, what we came to call the troublemaking wing of the labor movement. Remember, this was the tail end of the post-World War II economic boom, uh, and people didn't know it was going to be the tail end. The founders of Labor Notes expected to keep on building on an upsurge of organizing and strikes. And this was an era when employers still behaved as if unions had a right to exist. Unions expected their contracts to get better each time, and they did. Uh, and at the top of unions, there was not even a pretense of getting members involved. But that same year, 1979, profound changes began. Most important was the launch of an employer's offensive, followed by a political offensive against any and all worker rights. Chrysler came and asked for concessions, and the union gave them, and then the landscape shifted very quickly. Other employers started doing the same. Reagan fired the air traffic controllers. You could no longer assume that union contracts would get better each year, rather the opposite. To their credit, the people who founded Labor Notes stuck to it and began organizing to resist this new onslaught. And over the years, Labor Notes has continually irritated many labor movement leaders first by opposing concessions and organizing conferences on how to beat them. Labor Notes offered a critique of labor management cooperation, which was a vogue for a while, and an analysis of lean production, the sophisticated method bosses were using to uh, speed up, de-skill, and divide workers to increase productivity. We became a hub for people who were devising strategies to defend against speed up while much of the mainstream labor movement was going along with it. In 1980, we published our first pamphlet, Stopping Sexual Harassment, which would later become a book. Uh, and our magazine offered honest news, analysis, and debate, including on union democracy questions. Most labor leaders, when they explain the decline in union strength over the last 40 years, blame the attacks from employers, or NAFTA, globalization, or technology, or more lately, the Republicans. And those are all true. But one of the reasons for our success is that Labor Notes has always been willing to tell the truth about the mistakes that labor itself has also made. Uh, this has resonated and still resonates with rank and file workers who uh, too often see many union leaders making excuses for why they can't try to win anything. Sometimes they see them actively campaigning for concessions. They see undemocratic union meetings, which most don't bother to attend, and unions run by a small clique. They see national unions that seem as impenetrable and far away as any government or corporate bureaucracy. <coughs> so when someone criticizes that behavior and even has an explanation for it, they get it. 
contrary to what you might hear, we're not rock throwers. We're not just rock throwers. We uh, <laughs> regularly try to highlight the victories, both small and big, that unions have. Uh, and we do it in a nuts and bolts way, designed to help other union members follow their example. And we've always been the place where rank and filers would come when they wanted to change their union from below or challenge their union leadership and run for office, whether they're teachers, flight attendants, campus workers, nurses, machinists, graduate employees, postal workers, rail workers, to name just a few. In workplaces where there's, uh, well, in workplaces everywhere, there's a militant minority who want to build a fighting union. Sometimes they're able to work with their union leadership, sometimes not. Either way, the role of Labor Notes is to bring them together, help them recognize they're not alone, and help them learn skills to increase their numbers and influence. Today, one of the most exciting examples is among teachers. The United Caucuses of Rank and File Educators is a network of teacher organizations uh, that Labor Notes helped found and maintain that includes nine local or statewide unions as well as 13 caucuses. Reform-minded Friends of Labor Notes are running big unions that have become forces for change, including the teachers in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in the state of uh, Massachusetts, and they're inspiring others to follow their examples. They're all fighting uphill battles, but they've already won some phenomenal victories defending public schools and revenue against billionaire opponents. The Labor Notes Conference has grown bigger and bigger. We had 2,500 people there last time, and this year's conference in April is on track to be just as big. Show of hands, is there anyone in this room who already knows that they're planning to attend the Labor Notes Conference this year? Great. Well, I hope more of you will think about it. Um, I had someone say to me yesterday, members in my union, their minds are blown when they meet someone in another local and find out they're experiencing the same problems. Imagine when they get in a room with unions from around the world who are experiencing the same things and fighting for the same things. Our books serve the same goal, helping workplace troublemakers to realize they're not alone and arming them with the practical tools they need to transform their unions. After the Chicago teachers electrified the country with their 2012 strike, we interviewed dozens of them to write our book, How to Jumpstart Your Union, Lessons from the Chicago Teachers. And our newest book, Secrets of a Successful Organizer, walks through the steps of mapping your workplace, building an organizing committee, identifying a hot issue, building an escalating campaign, the idea is to democratize these skills that are uh, too often taught only to staff organizers, if them, uh, but should be part of the toolkit of any rank and filer. Today, the labor movement is in a serious crisis. I think probably everyone in the room is aware of that. 25, 27 states uh, have right to work laws, which weaken union strength and budgets by giving workers covered by contracts a short term financial incentive to opt out of membership. And in a few months, uh, the Janus versus AFSCME case at the Supreme Court is very likely to make the whole public sector right to work and drastically reduce membership. Union density keeps falling in both the public and private sectors, and we're facing a nationally coordinated employer offensive. Union democracy is more important now than ever. If unions have only shallow connections to their members, when people get the chance to opt out, they will. The unions that build power in Open Shop America will be the ones that fight hard on workplace issues their members care about and activate large numbers of rank and filers in their own fights. Undemocratic unions won't be able to inspire and mobilize the thousands of volunteer member organizers that we're going to need to turn around the decline in union membership. Staff organizers, no matter how good they are or how hard they work, will not be able to do it on their own. Remember the story I told you at the beginning of the talk about the bus drivers in Nashville who ran for office and won a better contract campaign? They're in Tennessee, which is a right-to-work state, so people don't have to be union members. But as soon as the new leaders got people fired up and ran a better contract campaign, membership in the local jumped up from 60 to 80 percent like that. And I could tell you story after story like that that we've been reporting on in Labor Notes, where a union went from low to high membership in a right-to-work state simply by organizing a good contract campaign that meaningfully involved members and won improvements on workplace issues they cared about. And you can read those stories in the pages of Labor Notes. Uh, which there's some free copies over there on the table, uh, and um, Amber has generously offered to sponsor the first 30 subscriptions. Uh, so after the event, if you want to go sign up uh, and get a free subscription to Labor Notes, we'd love for you to read it uh, and tell us about your fights and write for Labor Notes yourself. Um, and in April, I hope you'll join me and Beth and Pam and many people in this room at the Labor Notes conference in Chicago uh, to repeat the slogan that uh, for many years graced our masthead, it's time to put the movement back in the labor movement. Yeah, please consider um, the Labor Notes Conference, too. Uh, if only because everyone I've known who has attended said, I'm really optimistic after leaving, <laughs> which is hard to come by these days. Um, but I think we're going to, did we decide? Okay. So we're 
going to go, we can go with Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Hi, so um, my name is Beth Breslau. I'm an organizer with Teamsters for Democratic Union. Um, I worked for two years um, with the Teamsters United campaign, which is separate but in coalition with TDU, which is going to kind of be relevant to what I talk about. Um, so many of you, like Amber mentioned, have heard of the Teamsters Union and are aware of its existence. It's one of the, most lar it's one of the largest and most powerful unions in the country with 1.3 million members, many in trucking and transportation, but lots in other industries too. Um, Teamsters for Democratic Union is the reform caucus of TDU, um, and it's part of the cohort that Al described. Um, so I'll give a brief history, but I'm mostly going to focus on the past few years and the next few years, um, or what we are hoping for in the next few years. So TDU was formed in 1976 as part of the Labor Notes cohort at a time when the Teamsters were heavily influenced by the mob. There was a lot of fear among the rank and file, but TDU was able to break through that. Committed young leftists and activists got involved got, with rank and file jobs and formed a strategy group that attracted longtime Teamster activists who for years had wanted to reform and needed an organized group to work a plan and transform their union. The mob was in the background, but the rank and file struggle for a democratic militant union was the motor. TDU won the right to vote by majority on contracts and the right to a one member, one vote democratic election process for international union leaders, which replaced the old system where local union officers doubled as convention delegates and voted on international union leadership according to the interest of the mob instead of the interest of the members. Every five years there's an international union election and every time TDU backs a slate and builds organization around electing reform leadership that will fight for the members. So in the last international union election in 2016, TDU backed a coalition slate headed by Fred Zuckerman, leader of one of the largest locals in the, in the country and the largest UPS local in the country. He came to national prominence in 2013 when the international union imposed a concessionary regional UPS contract on his members after they voted it down by 90%. The slate was made up of former Hoffa supporters, some, uh, some officers, some rank and file members, and some longtime TDU activists. It was a coalition. We started our campaign in the summer of 2015 with a petition drive to get candidates accredited. During the petition drive in New England, one of our activists was chased around the parking lot by an officer's lackey. Um, so that's kind of the tone, you know, like even if officers weren't really cheerleaders for Hoffa and they weren't, you know, breaking anyone's kneecaps, they would make your life harder um, if you were campaigning for reform. In the, in the fall and winter of 2015, there were delegate elections in every local, there are over 400 locals, to send delegates to the nominating convention. During delegate elections, members in Indiana running against incumbents planned a hog roast to kick off their campaign. They had a hog donated, they had a space rented, um, and a few days before the event, they started receiving threatening phone calls, and so the independent election supervisor um, mandated that they hire security for the event. So it's not as scary as the earlier days of mob control, but being a reform activist in the Teamsters is still not a cakewalk. Um, at the nominating convention in the summer of 2016, thousands of delegates gathered in Las Vegas wearing vests to show their support for one slate or another. So in a Las Vegas convention center, you walk in, you see 4,000 people wearing red vests, 100 people wearing black vests, and we were the ones in the black. <laughs> Um, but enthusiasm for Hoffa didn't match the visual at the convention or on the campaign trail. A longtime Teamster official on our slate described the Hoffa supporting officers' participation in the election as just going through the motions. Um, what he said was, everybody just look kind of, looks like they're at the same movie they've seen a hundred times before. Teamsters United got on the ballot at the convention with the bare minimum of, de of delegate votes, but we were able to build a, an army of rank and file campaign activists and won the majority of the vote in the United States. We narrowly lost at large with 48.5% of the vote. It was the closest Teamster election in the history of the union. Um, the outcome of the past election was largely shaped by concessionary contracts members are working under now. At UPS, UPS, and, UPS Freight and Freight, which comprises close to a third of the international union's membership, members do want change and new leadership. In those three groups, they're all under national agreements negotiated by the international, 70% of members voted for new leadership, which helped us win the majority of the vote in the United States. In the last UPS contract in 2013, there were givebacks on health care and pensions. The contract language wasn't updated and strengthened to keep up with increasing volume due to more online purchases and just overall changes in the logistics industry. 
Drivers are expected to make hundreds of stops per day, and technology makes it possible for the company to measure a driver's every move. If a driver stops for three minutes and they take longer than the computer thinks they should to deliver their load, they're asked how they spent those three minutes. Part-time pay negotiated was pathetic. Half the workforce, which is roughly 125,000 members across the country, are part-timers with a starting rate of $10 an hour and only a three and a half hour a day guarantee. That's less than $200 a week to live on. Members describe the preload shift, which is the shift where package handlers load the brown package cars that deliver your packages to your door, um, as just four straight hours of getting screamed at before the company literally shoves you out the door because they don't want to pay you one minute extra. Both part-time and full-time workers are harassed and disciplined on productivity. This holiday season, as Amber mentioned, UPS implemented a 70-hour work week nationwide, which allowed them to work members six days a week, nearly 12 hours a day. Members in New England were able to get organized and hold parking lot rallies and protests. The company had to back off. But elsewhere, the company got away with it because members lacked institutional support to organize. TDU works with rank and file members to get organized, providing a national network and a national message that the company and Hoffa's hand-picked negotiating committee will notice. Members are fighting to end part-time poverty with increased wages and daily guaranteed hours, end over dispatch, stop harassment, and create more full-time jobs. We recently held a conference call of nearly 1,500 people making plans to get organized. The UPS contract expires in July, followed by the National Master Freight Agreement in 2019. In 2020, we'll kick off our, our campaign for the next international union election. To win in the next IBT election in four years, we need to build a strong rank and file contract campaign presence at UPS, UPS Freight, and Freight. We need to use that momentum to win support from more local union officers. The convention showed how out of touch officials are with the membership. TDU offers reformers resources and training to plan to run for office, starting with building organization where they work and beyond. Members come to our annual convention to meet other activists, develop their skills as organizers and shop stewards, prepare to run for office, and more. We hold trainings and work on organizing campaigns to build strong grassroots contract fights, contract campaign enforcement campaigns, local union bylaws reform, and pretty much anything a member calls and needs. We're not just about elections, we do the day-to-day -day grievance work too. We fill in the blanks that are left behind weak union leadership. There's lots of intimidation and bullying in local union elections, and employers are generally on the side of the sellout incumbents for obvious reasons. Members who challenge incumbents can face retaliation by employers and can be then thrown under the bus by the officers that are meant to represent them. In a North Carolina local where we're currently working with reformers on local election plans and contract campaign, when a member files a winning grievance, they're immediately asked, would you settle for half? Worse than that even, there are sometimes business agents settle for half without even asking. Reformers ran for office there in 2016 and lost by three votes, but they're preparing to run again next time. The last five years have brought TDU to a crossroads. Rank and file members are coming together to fight for good contracts, bring militant and grassroots contract enforcement into the workplace, and run for office on their earned reputations and, as union leaders. Taking over the Teamsters Union means electing progressive, democratic, and militant leadership in the most powerful union in the country and can transform our labor movement. Imagine the possibilities. Organizing Amazon workers in a, co a coordinated effort nationwide, organizing with port workers and retail workers to leverage power over, over global supply chains, and building an actual international labor movement. The next IBT election is in 2021, and we can win. And just real quick, um, you can learn more about TDU um, and our reform efforts and meet with one of our founding members and our national organizer, Ken Paff, um, at a fundraising event we're throwing here. Uh, New York City's DSA Labor Branch, Labor Notes, and TDU are hosting an event here at Verso on February 9th. We'll have guest speakers including Ken Paff, um, a UPS part-timer from Local 804, uh, Lennox James, the DSA secretary and rank and file carpenter, Laura Gabby, and Judy Sheridan Gonzalez, the president of NISNA. So that's, that's here. Go to that. Okay. Um, I will definitely be there. Also, I love the, um, the hog roast as a Hoosier. That is the most Hoosier thing I have ever heard of. A bunch of Teamsters at a hog they ran roast. for local office yeah. a year later, and they had another hog roast. We love pork products. Um, uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, and I think we're just going to go straight to Pam to talk about CWA. Okay. 
Thank you. Let me get set up here. Um, so um, I'm a field technician at Verizon uh, and a shop steward and uh, mobilization coordinator for my local, which is CWA 1101. Um, and I've been at Verizon almost 19 years. Um, for the last six years, I worked a couple days in the field as a field technician and then three days a week at the local um, as doing mobilization and communication. Um, and I would say without a doubt for those 19, almost 19 years, the best day that I had at Verizon was the day that we walked back in after the 2016 strike. Um, we, I had been on strike twice before at Verizon, but this strike was very different, and it felt very different, I think, for, for everyone who was involved. I want to talk a little bit about that strike um, and why I think it was successful and what role rank and file mobilization played in the strike. Um, and then also a little bit about how the reform effort in my local, which was just one of many locals that participated in the strike. Um, it was a uh, strike of 39,000 workers from Massachusetts to Virginia, so there were many, many locals who were involved. But I think that the reform effort in my local um, contributed to the fact that we had such a, a large, militant, mobilized workforce. Um, and, and that contributed to, to winning the strike. Um, so in April of 2016, about 39,000 IBEW CWA members um, all up and down the, the East Coast went on strike. And it was a time when there was a lot of questioning both within the union and outside the union whether it was possible to win a strike. Um, and certainly whether it was possible to win a strike in telecom. And whether it was smart to have an open-ended strike um, as opposed to a, a shorter strike which, which a lot of unions have experimented with lately. So, when we walked out on April 13th, it wasn't the beginning of that struggle, but it was really, it had been about a year, a year and a half of mobilizing on the job and also in the street, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and, um, and 10 months in bargaining. The last time we had struck was in 2011, and that was before this strike, the biggest strike in the US in many years, in, since, I think since the UPS strike in 97. Um, so in 2011, we struck for two weeks. We went back without a contract, but with a promise of good faith bargaining from the company, and spent about another year trying to mobilize bargaining, and ended up with a contract that most members were not happy with. We started paying for our health benefits for the first time, and I think the overriding feeling in the union was we went back too soon, um, and made people question whether or not the national leadership, the union as a whole, was really capable of launching, winning a strike, and what that meant in terms of our power. So people were very demoralized after that strike, and there was a lot of pressure from Verizon in the workplace to speed things up, and um, it became a much less of a, I don't know if you want to say fun, because it wasn't so fun before, <laughs> but it became a much more pressured job than it had been. Um, so in 2016, the national leadership pledged that we wouldn't go back without a contract, and I think rank and filers were really committed to holding them to that promise. Um, my local represents about 3,400 Verizon workers in Manhattan and the Bronx, and we also represent AT&T mobility workers, um, some healthcare workers, um, but Verizon and AT&T mobility are really the, the bulk of the local. We had a lot of changes in that local, which was the biggest local in the, in the strike footprint in the last six years. In 2008, the entire local leadership of the local were retired from Verizon. So they still were officers, but they had retired from Verizon, many, uh, not almost all of them, many for years. And so they had been out of the workforce for a long time. So in 2008, two reformers ran for office. They got crushed. Um, in 2011, we put together a full slate and an organization, and we ran as Rebuild 1101 um, and won that election two to one. People were really ready for a change in the local. That reform group um, and that executive board ran again in 2014 and won, and then just ran again last year and, and took office for their, for their third term. Um, 
And we didn't start that process from scratch. We built on other reform efforts, primarily that we had learned about at Labor Notes and TDU. Um, learned a lot from those efforts and really implemented a lot of those lessons. But as a lot of folks here probably know, the hardest work starts when you're in office. And it's hard to deliver when you're up against ruthless employers like Verizon, employers who are really committed to squeezing everything that they can out of their workforce, despite the fact that they're making tremendous profits. And folks here probably know Verizon, like many of these companies, like UPS, is just incredibly profitable, but still doing everything it can to squeeze as much as it can from its workforce. So things have changed a lot in Verizon as well. Things change in our local, but in Verizon and telecom, deregulation, um, a shrinking workforce meant we had a lot less leverage in bargaining than we had had previously. And of course, the rise in wireless meant that not, people weren't de depending on their landline in the same way that they had previously. So it was this huge shift, and there was kind of a sense of we don't have the bargaining power that we used to, and maybe we can't win a strike the way that we used to. Because the contract that we have is really, and it's a contract, it's about this big, um, was really built on many strikes and a lot of struggles over the years. Um, but the first day of the strike, we had a big kickoff rally in Midtown Manhattan <clears throat> at 6 a.m. and there were about 800 workers there. And I thought, okay, this is gonna be good. <laughs> this is gonna be okay. And really that, I think what happened was people had been, we had been mobilizing, working to rule on the job, picketing Verizon wireless stores, holding rallies, doing everything that we could for more than a year as part of a contract campaign to try to get people mobilized. But we weren't getting any movement at the bargaining table and people felt like, you know, got to a point and as a mobilization coordinator you're just constantly asking folks to do stuff, trying to get your activists to ask people to do stuff and people started saying, don't ask me to come to a rally, don't ask me to show up early at work, don't ask me to work to rule, we're not having any impact here and the only thing that's gonna have an impact is a strike and we weren't striking. And so there was a real kind of tension and, and frustration around that. So I think that when we finally walked out the door, people felt like, oh, now we're in a fight. Now, I, now this is a real fight, and this is a fight with real stakes, and we have a chance of winning something here. And members really stepped up, and it was pretty incredible to see. So we picketed, how many folks here went to a picket line or participated in rally during the Verizon strike? in 2016, thank you. Um, we had so much support and we needed it because <clears throat> we picketed anywhere that Verizon was doing work and this is something that some unions do but a lot of unions don't do, which is we didn't just picket the locations where the work was being done but we mobile picketed the telephone poles, the manholes, the commercial and residential buildings, like anywhere that there's a Verizon scab or manager working, we have a right to picket. So we picketed all of those locations. And folks here probably saw, we had people in red shirts, which is the signature color, driving around, looking for any work that was happening, following trucks, looking for people in the outer boroughs on poles, looking for open manholes. We picketed every Verizon wireless store, which for, for my local was 17 in Manhattan and three in the Bronx, which is a lot of stores to cover all day. But we had big, rowdy pickets at those stores with a lot of support from allies. Um, and we picketed pretty much anywhere else that we could think of where we would be a visible presence. We had big mass rallies. We had a march across the Brooklyn Bridge. It was the Democratic convention, so Bernie Sanders was in town, Hillary Clinton was in town. But Bernie really had been talking about these messages that were the messages of the strike because Verizon was trying to send work overseas, squeeze more out of its workers here, transfer people, have us pay more for our health care, um, decrease, you know, all of these different issues, many of them were the same issues that Bernie was talking about nationally, the growing inequality gap, greedy corporations. And so that really resonated with the folks and he was able to bring a national spotlight to that, to those issues. Um, so the issues that strikers were talking about in the press, and of course there's a lot of work that went into people really getting up to speed on the issues and talking with press about it, um, resonated nationally. Verizon was housing scabs in these fancy midtown hotels. We found where the hotels were and we had really big, rowdy 7 a.m. pickets at those hotels every morning. And pretty much with, after the first week or two of that, management started coming down 
and saying, okay, we're gonna kick out the scabs by 10, could you please just leave? So here was, you know, and it was very empowering because you got the, you know, you're on strike, you're looking for your activist core, not, not every single member, but we had people picketing, but it is demoralizing to be on strike and to just, to feel like you're not having an impact. So that process of really building momentum and finding different targets, and then, for instance, having these loud pickets at the hotels in Midtown at 7 a.m. where there's a ton of people around, and then have management come down and say, you know what, we're gonna kick out the scabs, was empowering for people and sort of built this tremendous momentum. So then, of course, Verizon got an injunction against the pickets, so you have to find new targets. But members were coming forward with targets. What about the radio stations that are advertising for Verizon workers for scabs? Why don't we, why don't we go leaflet there? Why don't we go to Good Morning America and the early morning shows? Why don't we bring people there at 6 a.m. to have a presence there? And there were, it was great. I mean, it, after a year of trying to get folks to step up and do stuff it, with different levels of success, here were tons of members saying, why don't we do this? Let's do this. I'll be here. I'll get 10 people to come here. And that process of seeing, you know, I think, I think Al said earlier, when people feel like they have agency and they have some ability to participate in the fight and what's happening there, people step up and they want to be a part of that. And that to me was one of the most inspiring things to see that happened during that strike. Um, so in the field, the work wasn't getting done. There was a lot of national press around the strike. Um, profits were down and it, you know, things, folks here probably know the strike continued for seven weeks. So that's a long time for people to be without a paycheck. It's a long time to try to keep up your momentum, look for new targets. Um, but I think that being on strike, and this was helped by the fact that the CWA did a very good job of showing stories of people all across the country, or all up and down the footprint who were on strike, you felt like you were part of something bigger. You felt like you were part of this movement that was really taking on corporate greed and taking on um, these companies that were treating their workers so unfairly and that you were part of something bigger and you had the ability to really make a change there. And so that sense, I think, really helped people stick it out and have the the grit and the, you know, decide I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, this is really rough and I don't have any money and I'm not sure how I'm gonna pay my mortgage, but we're gonna stick this out for as long as it takes. Um, and that was really key. So after 45 days, we went back um, with a contract that was, basically had beat back every concession that Verizon had put on the table. And it was a really long list of concessions. Um, there were 100 Verizon wireless uh, technicians who were on strike and also the six stores in Brooklyn were the only Verizon wireless stores who were who were unionized and they were on strike as well and so um, that also you know was sort of a new a new piece for us because trying to get the wireless workers organized and as part of the union was a really important part of trying to look at the way in which the industry had changed and the fact that we need to be able to organize wireless workers as well um, folks here may also have been familiar with the AT&T mobility strike, which, which happened in May. That was a three-day strike, and it was the first time that most of those workers had gone on strike ever. Um, they just ratified a contract at AT&T mobility, which had wage gains. Um, some uh, brought work back that had been sent out to, from, to call centers overseas. Didn't have everything we wanted, but I think was sort of an important step in terms of building power among wireless workers. And to get wireless workers to the place of having really strong contracts, those kind of, the kind of contracts that we have in, in Wireline is an incremental process, so we're, we're working on that. But I think, and I don't want to talk for too long, um, we learned a lot from the strike, and I want to just talk a little, very briefly about what some of what, what those lessons were. Um, when members felt like they were part of a fight with a purpose, they were all in. Even if that meant taking big risks and making sacrifices, when it felt like we were just going through the motions, it was really hard to get participation. But when people felt like this is a fight and it's worth fighting for and I'm gonna participate, we have a real chance of winning something here and something that's about us but also bigger than us, they were all in. Um, the long-term mobilizing and activism that we did in the year and a half leading up to that contract and all the 
years before that was frustrating and it was hard and it often felt like we weren't getting anywhere, but it really laid the groundwork for the strike being successful. And when we finally did go out on strike, people felt like we tried everything else and this is really our last shot and we're gonna have to stick it out for as long as it takes and you need that kind of durability to sustain a long strike. We thought people in the, the public support would be against us. I think that was a big concern. They're gonna say these are workers, they make a good wage, they have good, have good benefits, they have a pension, so many workers don't have that anymore. Why should we support them? And I think, and that didn't happen. We got tremendous public support. And I think it was partly one because people saw that there were big issues here about companies sending their work overseas, wanting to move their workers around here and there without any consideration for their family life. Companies that were making huge profits but had no regard for their workers' lives. Um, and so, and also I think it really tapped into this tremendous anger that people have about this growing inequality, what CWA calls runaway inequality. And I guess the, I would say we needed active, militant rank and file workers on the ground. We needed local leadership that was willing to really hold the line and say, we're not gonna get into a concessionary contract. And we needed a national leadership that was willing to put in the resources, and it was a lot of resources. 39,000 people on strike for seven weeks is a lot of resources in terms of strike benefits, in terms of all of the work that goes into it. It's a big commitment and you don't know how long that strike is gonna last. We needed a national leadership that was willing to do that and to take that risk and to, to provide that support. But we needed all of those things. If we hadn't had that mobilized membership and those that, you know, from the folks who were in Virginia, um, and to the people who were in Massachusetts and everybody in between, you could just see on the Facebook all of these different people in all different parts of the country and their families and the rallies and the pickets and the, and they looked different. You know, what we were doing in Manhattan looked really different from what folks in, in Pennsylvania were doing. But you could see everybody was doing something and people felt like they were part of this bigger fight. And it was really that rank and file activism that convinced the national that this fight was worth it and people were prepared to do it. And, and it was that activism that really sustained people and kept them willing to continue. And I think it was, the ref, you know, the, the strike was big and it involved a lot of locals. So it's, I couldn't say that the reform effort, you know, Amber said reform, you know, what impact the reform effort had. I wouldn't say that that was an overarching theme of what contributed to the success of the strike, but it certainly contributed to the militancy and the success of the strike in Manhattan and the Bronx and in New York City and in a lot of different locals that had active rank and files that had really pushed for reform and pushed for more militancy within their locals. And that made a big difference. Um, so, I think I just want to end by saying a little that you know that strike was inspiring to a lot of folks outside the labor movement it, in the labor movement it was inspiring to those of us who participated in it and I think one of the things that was to me most interesting to see was people stepped up and they took on roles that they had never thought they could do whether it was becoming a picket captain and leading their picket line or speaking to the press or giving a talk at an event in all kind, or coming up with different ideas, all kinds of different ways, members stepped up and took on these leadership roles and it sort of, li people lifted up together. And you really see that in strikes and in struggles, that you need that kind of struggle for people to come together and feel the solidarity and also to develop their skills and their experience as leaders. And we need more of those kind of strikes and militant struggles to really be able to move forward as a labor movement. And so it was, an, it was, um, it was a inspiring to be a part of that. And I think we've seen in this last year a lot of activism building activism in different unions against Trump and against what's happening. And I think we need to see, and hopefully we will see more of that kind of really militant struggle because I think that that's what will move us to the next place. So, thank you. Okay, 
So I'm going to do um, some brief kind of conversational questions. Um, and if we have time, we'll do a Q&A, but I'm not sure if we're actually going to ha have time because I know it has to get up here. Um, but uh, so actually, I was, I was uh, on the picket for that strike. And I have to say the most interesting thing about it, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I don't remember how I got there. And I, I, you know, I party, but not that much. But one of the interesting things is that that strike was very much in the ether, in the way a lot of labor activity is not. I can't even remember the first person that told me about it. Everyone just kind of showed up, um, and it does seem like, particularly with the more sort of um, rank and file movements, there is a new focus on outward facing campaigning towards people who are not in the union. And um, I wonder if any of you could sort of speak to the, I guess, for lack of a better word, you know, public relations kind of um, initiatives that unions are taking to um, let people know, uh, you know, what they're doing uh, in their workplaces. And anyone could jump on that. I guess I, uh, one thing I would say is, um, the public relations work and the sort of getting the work out, the word out about, is important, but it doesn't, the reason that some people f flocked to the, you know, kept coming back to the picket lines is because there were so many active workers there, mm -hmm. right? So if you go to a picket, you know, if you go to a picket line and there's a couple people there, it's a little bit, you're like, this is good, I'm here in solidarity, that's a good thing, but it's not, you, that rank and file activity, when it's there and it's vibrant and it's building momentum, I think helps build that public support. And so the, the, the sort of PR stuff doesn't really work mm -hmm. unless that rank and file activity is there. And then those folks are, sh you know, they're the sort of combination of the official, what's in the press and getting the stories in the press and getting the media around that is big. But then also there was just a tremendous amount of people sharing stuff on their own and grassroots organizing and getting their friends to come and adopt a store and support a picket line. and. Um, lots of different, you know, Labor Notes was doing a lot of different support activities and, and DSA folks did a strike support, strike solidarity and all these different groups in addition to the unions, other unions themselves were putting stuff out there and so I think that it does take on a life of its own when there's that building momentum and a lot of rank and file activism happening. Um, also, I do think it's interesting uh, you mentioned Amazon. Um, Verizon right now is, has this huge expanding retail section. Um, I wonder, sort of, I, I know that also there's like initiatives to, to you know, unionize retail as well. Um, I wonder, is there a sense of um, sort of a game plan going forward as the sort of the, the actual industry changes? And is that something that um, these sort of reform movements are addressing? Well, I guess, um, so our person who ran for general president of the Teamsters in 2016, uh, his local was contacted, I want to say like six months ago or a year ago, by some people who work at an Amazon warehouse uh, in or near Louisville. Um, and Kentucky just recently went right to work. I think the factory was technically in um, Indiana, which had already been right to work. Uh, it's really hard for one local in one city, in one state, in the country to have a successful organizing drive. So like an example, I mean this is why the reform movement's important. Um, the Teamsters sort of treat Right now, they've been treating, or recently, they've been treating uh, freight organizing and just logistics organizing in general like a, like a PR project uh, for their members, for the most part. Um, so you can have a few locals organizing FedEx or have a few locals organizing Amazon, uh, but if you're not really invested nationally and have a real plan for national coordination, what you're going to end up with is you win an election, you get recognition, and then you can't get a contract because the company just doesn't have a reason to give you a contract. 
you have no leverage. So what ends up happening? What ended up happening at a couple of FedEx places um, or FedEx freight barns was four years after they got recognition, they decertified the union. They didn't want to be part of it anymore. So that's. I mean, to me, that's part of the reason that I left kind of mainstream lab labor in the first place is because we need labor leaders that are going to, like Pam said, I mean, the strike, militant membership alone can't do it. It takes infrastructure and institution. Um, and, you know, that's, I think that's what it would take, uh, I guess, to organize Amazon. And I do think that there's an interest and a serious... Uh, commitment from reform leaders and from rank and file members to figure it out. And I would add that uh, an example of an industry where I think you do see that effect beginning to happen successfully is um, charter schools organizing as in, in part in response to and inspired by the uh, organizing and upsurge we've seen among public school teachers. teachers. Um, Teachers in public schools and teachers in charter schools can easily be pitted against one another. But in Chicago, for instance, after the teacher strike, there were charter teachers calling up the union saying, we want to join. We have the same concerns. We're facing the same conditions. And there's now uh, a union of charter school teachers in Chicago with a number of, of members. Um, so more internally, you spoke about, uh, about Teamsters running a slate of reformers. And there was a, a slate of reformers as well for a CWA. Um, your local. Um, I do wonder, is it more productive to come forward with a lot of people that are on the same page and have a line rather than have someone, um, you know, like a single person dedicated to, uh, dedicated to reforming the union and standing alone or whatever? Is, does, is it, does it matter to cultivate a kind of, for lack of a better word, cadre to run together? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I kind of know, but I want to just, you know, <laughs> kind of push it forward. <laughs> but, and there's certainly examples. Uh, I mean, I think um, uh, Pam was saying that you, you winning the election, as hard as that is, can be the easy part. Then transforming your union after that is the hard part. Uh, and when you, like, all too often, we've seen uh, somebody or even a group of people cobbled together who've run for office who what they have in common is they hate the incumbents or they don't like the status quo but they haven't built a, a, a base of support and a common vision for uh, for how to transform the union and built the sort of buy-in among members that it's not something new leaders are going to do it's something we're all going to do together uh, and very often then reform efforts falter and the next time around they get voted out as well. Um, the other thing I think, uh, you know, you mentioned Bernie, um, and it's difficult for me to not come back to this. I will probably come back to, to it in the next one as well. We are seeing a little bit of a push uh, towards um, class-based politics, um, even, uh, you know, uh, past the Bernie didn't make it through the primary. Um, do you think that, especially with the success of Trump, that unions are going to keep in mind going forward, um, uh, let's say, the um, lack of guarantee that we would have a Democratic president, and the lack of guarantee that even if we did have a Democratic president, they would be an advocate for labor in any way. I mean, what are they thinking about politics on the electoral level, I think? <laughs> I mean, it does. It feels like we're in a different terrain, like in a different moment, right? And so the whole uh, there's the, the all the states, the the number of states, including so many states like Michigan that we did not expect to go right to work are now right to work, and there, you know, in the prospect of. Um, the the case at the Supreme Court around the prospect of public sector workers. Um, you know, losing the, the, the right to organize for, for public sector orga workers and the whole, like it feels like the terrain is <laughs> shifting dramatically, but I think we are seeing a lot of, you know, lots of unions responding to that. So, so many unions have stepped up. They're organizing, camp their campaigns of getting their members signed up um, in the face of this uh, possible Janus decision at the Supreme Court. And so many unions have put, you know, are I think, looking at what do we need to do to build our infrastructure and build our strength internally and then be prepared to not just fight the boss but to be actually operating in an environment where the National Labor Relations Board is a lot more hostile than it was, um, where we can expect, um, you know, there were a lot of 
There were things that happened under Obama that made it, at least there were things that felt as though some things were getting easier on the organizing front, even if we didn't get the big wins that we had hoped for in terms of really changing the way that workers can join unions. Um, there were some smaller changes and that is all pretty much been pushed to the side. And so it feels like operating in new terrain and I think folks are all, a lot of the last year was sort of trying to get their ground their feet on the ground and figure out, okay, what do we need to do? And there's a lot to do and it's a pretty different environment, but that's where we are. Um, so, on that note, um, I think we're going to, we won't be able to record an, an audience Q&A because, uh, because of the audio, but um, we are going to have one, but uh, just to close out the live stream, um, we're going to go ahead and thank everyone for being here right now. Um, make sure also after the Q&A you line up and get your subscription to Labor Notes. Uh, thank you, Beth, Pam, thank you. and Alexandra. Um, and thank you all for showing up. Okay, so I think we're going to unplug, but if anyone wants to, I think we're going to line up like three at a time or whatever. You may just want to drink, that's fine too. Uh, but if any, does anyone have any questions? Let's take a show of hands. Who wants to drink? Okay, who wants to ask a question? Okay, well, you can ask, yeah. Uh, could you just stand so people sure. could hear? Yeah. Um, talking about Here we go. Amazon. Uh, we were talking about Amazon earlier, and this reminded me of, um, I was talking with my sister actually a while ago, and she was, she's boycotting Amazon right now, and we got into a little of an argument because I um, wasn't sure how effective that was, seeing as there's not like a mass uh, support behind that, so it, um, I Have was- Have the workers called a boycott? Right. That was, yeah, that was my objection to it. Uh, but that seems like that could be an effective strategy going forward is boycott. I, I guess I wanted to see what your thoughts were on the efficacy of boycotts um, and the danger of it kind of becoming like a lifestyle thing, like just helping competitors of Amazon. So that's my question. That was a genuine question, by the way. I, I, I feel like I would have heard about it, but I don't think anyone at Amazon called for a boycott, right? No, okay. not that I've heard. <laughs> Um, I mean, I agree with you. I think a, a boycott is an effective tool when it is uh, called by workers, planned strategically, and in conjunction with a workplace-centered organizing campaign. So, for instance, there's a group of um, berry pickers in Washington State who organized an independent union, had a number of wildcat strikes, and uh, last year won union recognition and a contract with a $15 an hour minimum wage is just amazing uh, for farm workers. And in the course of that campaign, they called a boycott on Driscoll's berries because Driscoll's was, was selling their packaging and selling the berries from their employer. There was a lot of, especially in, in Washington state, there was a lot of activism at, uh, at grocery stores pressuring the stores not to carry the berries. I think that's an effective boycott. It, in support of the strikes in the campaign the workers have. I don't see what good boycotting Amazon uh, individually would do, and it's such a large corporation that even a large-scale boycott, uh, you need to have a very carefully thought plan, I think, for how that was gonna work. There was the one back here. Uh, in the front first, and then the back. Um, so I was talking to a former member of the International Socialists recently, um, which was a socialist organization, fairly small but very committed socialist organization in the late 60s to mid 70s. And he said that without a doubt, the, the most important thing that they did was help to build TDU and the International so or, and Labor Notes, excuse me. Um, so I'm sort of wondering from the perspective of uh, Labor Notes, TDU, and CWA, like what what would you say to how how do uh, socialists, especially organized socialists, help you all? And what would you say, especially to people, say, since the Bernie campaign, that have maybe become interested in class-based politics 
but aren't really well versed in the labor movement, don't know a ton about history, haven't really been in, in an, uh, either in an organized union or an organized socialist organization um, before this. So that's my question. Um. Well, I'm a socialist, <laughs> uh, and um, I think, t you know, and I, I um, became politically active at a time when, you know, at a time when uh, most of my political activism was around Latin American solidarity. There was Palestinian solidarity, a lot of Palestinian solidarity happening on the campus where I was. There was a lot of um, anti-racist work going on. There was a lot of ten there was just, there was a lot of really exciting things happening, but there wasn't a lot of discussion of or talk about labor organizing. Um, and it was really through folks um, who had been in the IS, who were had helped found labor notes, who had helped found TDU, who were part of this effort of really building democracy within the unions that I really became sort of started learning about the role of the working class in a broader movement for social change and what, um, why that was important and what, uh, what some of that history was and then really started thinking about, oh, well, what would it mean to get a job where, um, you know, as a, as a working, as a rank and filer, a job that I could live with and, and you know, enjoy as a job but also be part of a, of a something bigger be part of something that was actually, um, whether it was, you know, something that was part of this bigger tradition of trying to bring about change through organizing. Um, and so, you know, but it was, I think over the years, it has been a lot, it has, it's been a struggle to figure out what does it mean to be a socialist at a time when uh, there's not a lot of socialist activity taking place and not a lot of success. and. Um, and what does it mean to be a socialist and an activist within the labor movement? And um, those are really big questions to grapple with. But I think it's good that we're grappling with them. And I think it's good that there are so many folks joining DSA, for instance, um, and, you know, and, and tr sort of trying to figure out, OK, what is a new kind of, what does it look like now? What does it look like to be a socialist now? What does it mean that Bernie was able to um, sort of make that a, more of a, bring that discussion into a wider, broader range for people, but then what does it mean for folks really on the ground in their day-to-day -day nitty gritty, and how do we figure out what our role is there? So I feel like I'm not really saying anything anymore, but um, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah I, I'm in DSA and have been for a very long time, and um, I'm a fairly traditional socialist, and I believe that there is no, there will not be any socialism without an invigorated broad working class movement that includes a, you know, a militant trade union movement. Um, but I will say it was interesting during the, if you know the history of the organization during the early days, we actually had a lot of difficulty um, kind of, uh, unions were red shy um, for a, a lot of like obvious reasons. Um, and it, it was really interesting when I worked in the office and we would look at our union affiliates and it would be like all these very small, like, um, uh, like very like militant, uh, cool, but very like New York specific, um, small, like especially like builders, uh, trade, like, like building trades unions, like the sign painters union or something is apparently like a lifetime member of TSA. Um, and I think uh, it was actually uh, very difficult. I mean, we always had members that were in um, some of the larger unions that were, were rank and filers or um, staffers even um, that had you know massive complaints about the, the direction that um, you know the trade unions movement had had kind of gone. Uh, however, I, I do think we're at kind of a turning point where socialism is no longer a dirty word. Um, and we have always had, um, we've always had, always had, you know, organizations like Labor Notes, um, and there's always been like a, a left, you know, labor movement. It's just that now I think they're kind of gaining traction, particularly when um, both members and uh, sort of the institutional, um, the institutions of the unions themselves are realizing that, uh, you know, the way forward is actually kind of this, you know, it's. it's class politics and, uh, 
and uh, you know, broad social democratic demands. Um, I don't know, I'm actually really encouraged with these sort of things. But then again, like I'm organizing this thing, so obviously like I'm like, this is great, everyone's here, we're all on the same page, you'll be fine. Uh, there's one more? Uh, I forget who was who. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanna back what Beth was saying about the TDU and DSA, or New York City DSA labor branch event coming up on Friday, February 9th. I have some flyers that I'll hand out and maybe we can make some more copies, folks at Verso. Um, and then, and now pivoting into a question so I'm not my least favorite person. Um, I'm a, a recently turned public school teacher. Um, I was a, a CWA staff organizer for many years, but I was very invested in the idea, um, first off, of teaching young people and talking about ideas all day, but also um, building uh, a strong social justice union. And perhaps not for folks who are brand new to union politics, but for folks who are in this room who are already engaged and are already interested, or perhaps members of DSA, or other socialist organizations, is there any advice that you would give to a young, radical socialist who wants to help reform the union movement? Subscribe Thanks. to Labor Notes. <laughs> well, uh, we have members on our steering committee who are rank and file teamsters uh, who have much more radical politics than they would kind of talk about with any of their coworkers. So, um, one person comes to mind in particular, who if you come to the Labor Notes Conference, you will meet. Uh, he's a package driver in Columbus, Ohio, and um, he's been a socialist since he was young. He got radicalized when he was a teenager, and uh, when, he made the, when he made the decision to join the Teamsters Union, he was really kind of like down to earth and humble about it. And, he sort of was like, okay, I'm gonna get a job as a preloader at UPS, and I'm not gonna talk to every about, talk to all my coworkers about joining the Socialist Party or something. Um, he has a great reputation as a strong fighting shop steward, and he knows his contract better than, you know, whatever the most extreme version of a Christian is, knows the Bible. Um, he's, he's like, Every, when I have a question from another member who calls from any other part of the country about contract interpretation, he's the person I call. Um, his coworkers really respect him, and he's really building a stronger labor movement by being where he is. Um, and so I guess, I don't know, the, this turned into like a love fest about that person, but um, I guess from what I, have seen in TDU and our activists, it's sort of like, be humble, uh, learn from the people who know more about your job than you do because you're young and new, um, and become a resource and listen to what people want. Like, don't assume that everybody wants to hear about what you think are the biggest issues. I mean, it's kind of like basic organizing, but it's, sometimes really hard <laughs> to do those really basic things. So that's, that's No one likes a pushy salt. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one more and then we're gonna, yeah. Uh, hi, um, I'm actually a staff member of a, an SEIU local that will remain unnamed, but um, uh, s something that is interesting that's been happening lately is um, the, you may have heard of the like Me Too SEIU like push that's been going on. Um, so like you know, a vice president of SEIU was recently um, like accused of sexual harassment and and resigned. And um, someone at at the local at which I work, um, who was pretty high up in the administration, was is also under investigation for sexual harassment, and uh, probably like will not work there anymore in the near future. And um, so there's been kind of this interesting movement among staff, um, like particularly women, um, as seeing themselves, seeing ourselves like as workers as well, uh, because we're not unionized either. Um, and, and we're not allowed, we're like not allowed. We're this very strong union busting that happens uh, at, at the unions themselves um, when workers try to unionize. Um, so I guess, I guess my, my question is, um, you know, I think there's ways that staff at unions can sort of push to radicalize the institution from 
within to improve the working conditions for themselves and also, you know, like improve the politics of the union itself. But but beyond that, like I'm also at the same time part of the institution itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, what, what can staff members at unions who see that there's problems and see that the institution is a barrier um, for rank and file radical action and, and like what can we do about that? Well, as, a, as another uh, former SEIU stra staffer myself, um, I hear you. And uh, I, I think there's two pieces to your question. I mean, I, I uh, think it's absolutely righteous for staff members to stand up for their themselves in their own working conditions. And uh, there are some SEIU locals that have staff unions. I used to be part of mine. and uh, uh, But I, I agree with you, SEIU has a culture of um, of, of busting them and making it very difficult, and especially through the international and at certain locals, and uh, yeah, that's a tough battle. Uh, you have my support. Um, in terms of how, in terms of the the larger institution for members and the role of staff in uh, in making pushing their union in the right direction or or helping make it more democratic, I think really, I mean, it's got to be a project led by members. So the role of a of a union staffer is to train people in organizing and help give them the tools they need to lead that themselves. Just to add real quick to that, I also, former SEIU staffer at a local based in New York City, um, a large local, uh, you have to... That starts with. That starts with a number and ends in letters. Um, you, so I also had a similar experience there, and I'm happy to talk with you after. Um, and so I kind of, my uh, strategy was to just really be honest with members and with the workers that I was organizing who were hopefully going to become members. And sometimes that meant, like, I got scolded. I got scolded a lot of times. And I probably would have gotten fired if I had stayed there longer. Um, and I mean, it was, the, I mean, the reason I came to TDU is because I was like one person in a sea. Um, and there wasn't enough around to kind of make it happen. but. I do get to kind of enjoy the fact that like the places that I organized that got recognition don't take bullshit and they know their contract and they know their rights and they know how to get things for themselves so they don't have to rely on their union rep um, and you know the sort of go through the bureaucracy to win when they need to fight. Okay, so thanks very much to all of you. Thanks everyone uh, for showing up. Um, make sure you stop by the labor notes table and um, make sure you get a flyer for uh, the TDU event. And hopefully I will see a lot of you next month uh, when the subject is uh, labor power outside of the workplace. Thank you. Thank you.